Sky News Center. This is Sky World News Tonight with James Rubin. They operate in cells, ruthlessly singling out their targets. According to the FBI, animal rights activists are now the biggest terrorist threat in America. But it's a claim that's sparking a schism. Industry sides with the government, while campaigners say it's an attempt to suppress free speech. It all adds up to more pressure on the Bush administration, particularly now that a civil liberties group is challenging the legality of his domestic spying program. Our U.S. correspondent, Andrew Wilson, has the story. I, w I must warn you, his reports contain some disturbing images. Five, six, seven, eight. Break the locks and There's liberty. only a few of them, but that's all it takes. Bumpy killer! Murderer! Manhattan isn't large. Two banks and a stockbroker got the same treatment in one night. American animal rights activists have learnt from the Brits. If you can't hurt the animal testers, go after their friends. They do not want this. We have company, I mean, companies like the Bank of New York, Washington, which they all dropped so fast because of instances like this. They have a storefront, they're right here on the sidewalk, and so are we. And it's proven effective. Last year, the U.S. arm of Huntington Life Sciences UK was dropped from the New York Stock Exchange when the spotlight turned nasty. News of this abrupt backpedal in the business community spread quickly. Down Wall Street, out into the United States. Who were these shady groups who could wield such extraordinary influence? Suddenly, any company remotely connected with the world of animal testing was looking to its own defenses. Groups like the Animal Liberation Front are hard to tackle. The structures are loose, and like many terrorist organizations, there's no apparent chain of command. Arrests are on the up, but so are incidents of vandalism and harassment. Property damage is estimated at well over 150 million pounds. The FBI is on the hunt for more resources. The number one domestic terrorism threat is the eco-terrorism animal rights movement, if you will. And as I indicated a moment ago, there is nothing else going on in this country over the last several years uh, that is racking up the, the high number of violent crimes and, and terrorist actions, uh, arsons, etc. Uh, that, that this particular area of domestic terrorism has caused. Now look at me, do I look like a threat to domestic security? Activists, of course, scoff at the label. Being a native New Yorker and having lived through 9-11, it's hard for me to embrace that, that terrorist label. Um, I know what real terrorism is. Real terrorism is watching people jump out of windows of buildings, watching a plane fly into a building. What we do is not terrorism. What the Animal Liberation Front does is not terrorism. Video footage of inhumane treatment from the animal testing world is doing the rounds here. Even in this gun-toting society, few have the stomach to watch beagles being beaten by lab technicians. Every fucking time point! or monkeys undergoing drug tests and electric shocks, strapped down and screaming. The fight for America's moral high ground is on. For their part, the U.S. testing companies have launched their own charm offensive, releasing their videos of testing procedures and employing professional spokespeople. We have no problem with legal protests. Your ability to express your opinion is your freedom but it's when you say if you don't adopt my opinion I'm gonna get you that we part ways and that would be the dark side and that would be the part that we're seeing more of Americans love their hunting culture a father-son romanticism that dominates any urban sentimentality for animal welfare out in the woods stalking your quarry is part of the American dream Former cop and volunteer fireman Jim Babcock's been hunting all his life. So has his buddy Jim Strabone. And so has Jim's son Chris. Animal rights is a relatively new one on these guys. There's anti-fishing people. There's anti-skydiving uh, people too, you know. I think each to their own, but if you have an opinion, you, you can voice it. But, you know, don't wreck the woods with the anti ones because you'll hear them banging pots and pans and all this sort of stuff. But come on. That's only getting the hunters madder. 
But at the New Jersey bear hunt this year, as the hunters brought in their kills, adults and cubs, the police were there to keep the two sides apart. This guy said something to me, and I said, I'm just defending myself. You walk forward and start saying stuff to us. Okay, you got it. You guys walk away. You guys walk away. No problem. What happens, they have like bait stations, and what they do is they use uh, donuts, uh, things like honey, hamburgers, and, uh, and the, the bear will come to that bait station, and when they, when they come to that bait station, while, while he's eating the food, they're shot with a shotgun. That's, that, that's what they call the black bear hunt, and that's how it's done. It's pretty, pretty pathetic. Once again, more law enforcement, more resources. In America, animal rights protest seems to have evolved into three separate tiers. The first group specialized in bureaucracy, lobbying, going through the courts and so on. The second group involves protest and direct action, but strictly within legal limitations. And there's the third group that uses violence against property and against people. What isn't clear is how closely these three tiers cooperate or communicate. Open or secret, what is clear is they've got people's attention. Back in Manhattan at a private apartment this time, the protests provoke a reaction. Who is in charge? A neighbor trying to explain that his friend has already sold his shares in animal testing companies. Victory of a sort, but animal rights is becoming one of those issues now, where the line between debate and coercion is getting blurred. Andrew Wilson, Sky News, in New York. We're now joined from Los Angeles by Dr. Jerry Vlasic from the North American Animal Liberation Movement. Thank you very much for joining us. I guess the first issue that you must have been struggling with in your career is what gives you the right to uh, use violence to pursue your ends? Well, first of all, I'm not using any violence, but what I'm saying is that people are using violence every single day in massive quantities against these uh, innocent animals, and they're doing it unnecessarily, and it's uh, up to us to stop them from using uh, this violence against animals. It's, it's completely unnecessary, and furthermore, it wastes hundreds of millions of scarce health care dollars that could be used on more legitimate forms of medical research that are much more likely to help the patients that I treat uh, than chopping up animals in laboratories somewhere. Uh, you're being a little disingenuous, sir. You testified that uh, you said in your testimony that uh, activists should do whatever is necessary to stop animal experiments, including, if necessary, if there were no other justifiable way to do it, killing researchers. So when I asked you what gives you the right to choose violence and you turned to the question of violence against animals, you know that's not the issue we're trying to address here. We're trying to address whether you're right or you're wrong, and assuming you're right, what gives you the right to throw firebombs that may someday kill somebody or to actually uh, kill an innocent person who might be a, a, a cleaner in a facility that you firebombed. What gives you that right? Well, I've never backed down from the statements that I've made, and I have made those statements, that people who torture animals to death uh, should stop doing that. And if they should stop doing that when they're asked nicely, that would be great. And if they're stopped doing that when, they're, when it's explained to them that what they're doing is, is, uh, is, is not useful for human health and it, it's got absolutely no purpose other than their own personal satisfaction and advancement of their medical careers. And if they won't stop when that's explained to them, they should be stopped using whatever means necessary. And I've said this uh, far and wide on, uh, in the public on a regular basis. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to force you to look at the violence, the immense amount of violence that's perpetrated against animal rights activists as well as against animals and quit you from, and stop you from concentrating on the potential violence against those who abuse animals. Well, uh, you know, this is a society where you don't get to decide what we focus on. We had a film, I think it showed some violence against animals and it also showed some violence against shareholders and companies who, uh, who test animals. So we think we've done a fair representation of, of the issue, but you're a spokesman for a group that uh, has gone about uh, engaging in firebombing of facilities and has used violence. 
And, and so my question to you again, sir, is what gives you the right to decide when it's time to use violence? In a society that goes back thousands of years, that right has been given to lawmakers, not to individuals, however intelligent or well-meaning they may be. Well, two points. First of all, there, there's no comparison uh, with the violence used against animal abusers and that used by, against animals by the abusers. In a, in a single laboratory such as Huntington Life Sciences, 500 animals are tortured to death every single day. Now, when it comes to this issue about law and, and who should make the law and who should obey the law, don't forget that in, in my country, it was perfectly legal to own black human beings until 150, 200 years ago. In Nazi Germany, it was perfectly legal for them to do what they did to Jews and other, uh, other uh, misrepresented groups. It was perfectly within the laws there. So don't talk about having to obey the law as, as being the final authority. The law can be wrong. And in this case, a law that allows the torture of animals in laboratories, that allows the killing of animals for sport in the woods, uh, the laws that allow animals to be uh, placed in zoos, laws that allow animals to be anally electrocuted and have their necks broken so that their fur can be made into fur coats. Those laws are wrong, and if they're wrong, they need to be broken. Uh, you have every right, sir, to view that law as wrong. That's what happens in the United States in a democracy. Uh, but we do, as journalists and others, have a right to ask uh, about the violence to human beings. We are a nation of human beings, it says in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It doesn't say we are a nation of animals. And so when you choose to violate those laws, you are rejecting a compact that exists in society. And so I want to ask you again, if others think that laws that you like are wrong, do you want to give them the right to use violence to achieve their objectives? When another uh, group of people or another group of beings is being violently oppressed as animals are in our society and as black Americans were in, in the day when they were not protected by the Constitution, then I think people have a, a moral obligation to do what's right to stop that oppression, to stop that exploitation, to stop, stop that suffering. And if I was doing something that was uh, causing pain, suffering, and exploitation, I would hope somebody would stop me. I used to do animal research, and somebody did talk to me about it, and I did change my mind, and I'm, I'm out there trying to change other people's minds as well. Well, until the United States becomes a nation whose declaration says, we the animals, I think you're going to have a hard time winning that argument. Thank you very much.